Hello, and welcome back to Phil 320 Deductive Logic. I'm Professor Matthew J. Brown, and today we're going to be talking again about proofs in SL, and we're going to be learning about the derived rules and rules of replacement that we use in SL. Now, having seen the basic rules of SL, both direct and indirect proof, all the introduction and elimination rules for our different connectives, you might ask yourself, do we need more rules? The rules we've seen so far for our natural deduction system for SL are systematic, and they could let us prove anything that we need to prove, right? But there are some other rules that are, some of which are very intuitive, um, others are just convenient, and many you might say uh, many different proof systems include such rules in their systems. And so we're going to look at some of those rules now. We call these rules derived rules because um, they don't add new content to our proof system and they themselves can be um, can be established or um, shown to shown to be valid based on the existing rules. Um, one example is the dilemma rule, right? Uh, the dilemma rule shows that if we have three lines, the disjunction A or B, um, and the conditional if A then C, and if B then C, then we can derive the conclusion C, right? A, B, and C here are our script letter metavariables, right? Um, not just sentence letters. But um, this the, the intuitive idea here is that you don't know if A or B is true, but you know that one or the other or both are true. And if you have these two conditionals from A to C or B to C, um, then either way, C is going to end up being true. That's kind of the intuitive idea. P.D. Magnus actually shows the derivation for this rule in Chapter 6 of For All X. So if you want to see how a derived rule is derived, um, you can go look at that. Hypothetical syllogism is another fairly intuitive derived rule. This tells us that um, if we have the two lines M and M, if uh, A then B, if B then C, then we can conclude if A then C. It seems like a fairly intuitive rule. Its derivation is also shown in the book, and actually we we performed a version of this uh, derivation for a specific example in one of our previous problems that we worked out in a previous lecture. The last derived rule, which is in some proof systems treated as a basic rule, is called modus tollens, right? Um, and it is kind of the reverse of a conditional elimination rule. Instead of starting with the conditional and the antecedent, we start with the conditional and the negation of the consequent, and then we derive the negation of the antecedent. You'll actually have the opportunity to prove this one in one of the practice exercises in chapter six. Now, let me say again, you don't strictly need any of the derived rules. They only make proofs more convenient. Another kind of rule that makes proofs more convenient, we call rules of replacement. And so far, all of the rules we have seen only apply to whole expressions, right? So if we look at this argument and we want to prove um, if A, then B and C, therefore if A, then C, we might be tempted to use like the conditional elimination rule here. We've got B and C. Let's just use conditional elimination to pull out that C and, and do that directly. But you can't do that. That won't work. The conjunction elimination rule only applies to whole sentences where the conjunction is the main connective, right? In general, all of the introduction and elimination rules and all of the previous rules we've looked at only apply to the entire sentence and are focused on the main connective of that sentence, right? So to prove this, we'd have to go a different direction. We'd have to start with our premise. Um, we, in this case, would probably want to do a conditional proof since we're proving a conditional, right? We start with A. We know we want to get C. Um, we can use conditional elimination to get B and C. We can use conjunctional elimination to get C. Then we can discharge our subproof and get if A, then C. Now we did end up using 
conjunction elimination, but we couldn't apply it directly. We had to go through this subproof process. Let's look at another example. This seems like a fairly uh, intuitive thing to prove. If A, then B and C, therefore, if A, then C and B, it seems like we ought to be able to do that pretty easily, and we could. But notice that these two sub-expressions, these two components of the expression, um, are logically equivalent sentences. We know that the conjunction, the order doesn't matter. B and C, C and B, they mean the same thing, right? And there is a rule that allows us to replace that part of the expression. We call these rules of replacement. They involve substituting completely logically equivalent expressions or sub-expressions for one another. And let's go through the examples from the book. We have first the commutivity rules, right? They allow us to take any, uh, any conjunction, disjunction, or biconditional and substitute it for the reverse version. The order doesn't matter for these connectives and the commutivity rule reflects that, right? And again, you can apply this to sub-expressions, right? To parts of expressions that fit that mold. De Morgan's laws are another kind of replacement rule having to do with the interaction between negation, disjunction, and conjunction, right? Um, so if we have the negation of, the, of A or B, that's the same as not A and not B, right? If we have the, the negation of the conjunction of A and B, that's the same as not A or not B, right? Um, We've seen that uh, previously. We can show that with truth tables, that examples of that are the case. Um, and here, we, the rule allows us to make that substitution. Double negation, also a very helpful replacement rule. Whenever you've got two negations, you can, uh, you can eliminate the double negation. So not not A is the same as A. Also, occasionally, you might want to start from A and substitute in not not a, and that's allowed as well. We also have replacement rules based on the definition of the material conditional and the biconditional, right? We know our material conditional, if a then b, is equivalent to not a or b, right? And so we can use that fact to, to do this substitution of uh, the, we call this material conditional. The biconditional exchange uh, also allows us to use the fact that a biconditional, if A, if and only if B, is equivalent to if A then B and if B then A, right? So we can, we can go in either direction here as well and replace one expression with the other. Just to give you a sense of how we might justify um, some of these replacement rules. There's many different approaches. You can do it with a with a kind of meta language derivation. You can do it with truth tables. Um, I can show you with some Venn diagrams how we would do it for De Morgan's law here, right? So um, let's take this version. The negation of A or B is equivalent to not A and not B, right? So let's consider this circle A and consider this circle B, we know A or B is whatever is in either or both circles, right? That whole area in red is A or B. And the negation of that, right, is everything outside of that area, right? So the whole left-hand expression there is highlighted in green. Now let's look at the right side, right? So the red here is what is A, Right, that's that's all of the places where A applies, right? Um, and not A is going to be everything outside of that circle, right? Similar deal with B, right? Everything that is not B is what's outside that circle, right? And then in the conjunction of not B and not A is going to be every place where you have both. Um, which is highlighted in both this figure and this figure. And again, that's just everything that is outside of both circles. And that is the same as what we had here, right? In the one side. So 
Um, that is perhaps the least formal way to show it, um, but uh, it's interesting. You could also show it using truth tables, and I'd suggest you give it a try on your own um, and uh, try it for the other example of De Morgan's Law and any of the other um, uh, replacement rules as well. So that's a quick uh, tour of the derived rules and rules of replacement. Of course, the best way to learn how these rules can be used is to give it a try. So um, I suggest you go ahead and give the next set of practice problems a go and see if these any of these rules help you out in those cases, right? Next time we're gonna talk about strategies for doing proofs and we'll work some additional examples together. Okay, bye.